Father, one more time, we come before you, humbly asking you, God, to have your perfect will in your way today. Lord, we are so excited about the word today. Father, we just cannot contain what you've placed inside of us. So, Father, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Lord, will rest and reside upon each and every person under the sound of my voice. Lord, let the word today be prevalent. And I pray, God, that the word will be powerful as it's preached today. God, let it sink down to the deepest depths of our heart, not in one ear and out the other, God. And we pray, God, that your word will not only change us, but it will challenge us from the inside out, God. And we will begin to walk out what you've called us to do, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to hit for running today. Um, we are talking about build your house on the rock. We are taking this year to go through and, and uh, learn a little bit more about Jesus, get intimate with him, get cozy with him, um, kind of shift from uh, the generic, you know, God to really understand um, Jesus. And when we say that he's with us and he's for us and um, uh, just the identity of, of Jesus and what he said to us. So we're going through the red words of Jesus. We're going to be spending most of the year um, just kind of digging in and looking at the things that he said that he uh, gave us as a foundation. And uh, today we are talking about when he said to us that uh, we should follow him, and he will make us fishers of men. Pastor, you ready to run? Yeah, hey guys, He's quick, itching this morning. Uh, yes, I am excited. i uh, going to get my preach on in just a minute. Hey, real <laughs> quick, we, we have one announcement I forgot to say. Marriage ministry that is going to be in two weeks from now uh, actually is going to be postponed to a later date. And if you've already paid for that, we will quickly reimburse you. Um, but we're going to have to move that date. So um, we will let you know more about that in a very very near future. Amen. If you're on the uh, marriage ministry um, Facebook page, we will um, send some details to you there and Amen. we'll touch base with you. Okay. Hey guys, b before we get started, let's go ahead and throw that screen up there in Matthew uh, chapter four. But before we, we go there, let me, let me quickly give you the background of what was happening. Remember in the very first week of this red letter series, we were telling you that Jesus was in the wilderness where he was fasting and praying. And the Bible says that after he fasted, for 40 days, and he defeated the devil with, by the way, the word of God. Remember what he said? Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen? So the Bible says after he fasted and after he uh, defeated the devil, he made his way to the Sea of Galilee. And here is where we pick up the scripture. The Bible says Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to me, or to them, here's our key, and here's a topic entitled today, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Watch this. The Bible says they immediately noticed there was urgency. Yeah. They didn't sit back. But they stepped up. Can you say amen? The Bible says there was urgency. They, were, they immediately left their nets and they followed him. Notice there were two types of nets. There was a cast net used for catching fish in shallow water and also a drag net used to catch fish in the deeper waters. Let's go on. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. you got to realize when they fished at nighttime, during the daytime, they would bring their nets to shore. They would wash them, clean them, and repair them, or they would mend their nets so they could fish the next night. The Bible says he called them in what? Immediately. Immediately. Come on, guys. There's urgency when God calls you. Come on. You, you don't sit back. There's urgency when the Spirit of God calls you and commands you to do something. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says they left the boat and their father and they followed him. Now that's Matthew's take. And remember, there, there's four gospels, but you have three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, called the synoptic gospels, which means seen together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the same story, but they tell it from a different perspective or a different angle. And me, personally, I like Luke's account. And I'm going to give you, if I could quickly, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Notice it's not on your screen, but Luke is a little bit more detailed. Why? Luke was a doctor. How many know that doctors need to be detailed? Can I get a witness <laughs> somebody, right? So here's what happened. Luke begins to tell a different story from a different angle. 
And he tells us that after Jesus fasted for 40 days, that he left the wilderness and he made three stops and performed three miracles before he called his first disciples. The Bible says he left the wilderness and went inside the synagogue and began to preach the gospel. I love this story because in the midst of preaching, there was a demon-possessed man in church. Come on. Jesus wasn't intimidated. He was infuriated. As a man began to act up and speak out and freak out during the service, Jesus stepped out from behind the pulpit, made a beeline over to the demon-possessed man, laid hands on him, bound up the enemy, and rebuked the hell out of him. Can I get a witness, somebody? Literally. Come on, you can shake your head this way. It's okay. Literally. Then all of a sudden, he left the synagogue and went down to Simon's house. When he walked in the doorway, he found out that Simon's mother-in-law was sweating profusely, burning up with a fever. But can I tell you today that when the Son of God walked through the doorway of that house, that infor infirmity in the form of a fever recognized, honored, and obeyed his anointing and immediately began to leave her broken body. Can you say amen? amen. And then from the synagogue, he went to Simon's, from Simon's down to the seashore, and a crowd of people had gathered around Jesus anxiously awaiting every anointed word that came from the Messiah's mouth. As they were pushing and shoving, trying to get next to Jesus, Jesus noticed that there was a boat in the water. But notice the apostles were not in the boat. They were in the water washing and cleaning the nets. And Jesus stepped inside of one of the boats that happened to be Simon Peter's. He looked at Peter and said, get out of the water and get into the boat and thrust out a little from the shore. And as the boat began to drift backwards, watch this. It was in Peter's boat that Jesus used as a pulpit and a platform to preach to the people who were on the seashore. Can you say amen? And as the word of God was preached and the last altar call was given, Jesus looked at Peter and said, launch out into the deep. And here's a story that I want to tell quickly. As Jesus told Peter to go out into the deep waters, first of all, how many know that Jesus knew where the fish were? Come on, guys, right? So all of a sudden, as Jesus tells Peter to launch out into the deep, Peter begins to argue with the Lord. The question I want to ask you today is this. How come every time God commands us, there's always a complaint that comes from us? Well, come on, I can see you. I just can't hear you this morning. When God expects us to do something, we respond with an excuse. Peter said, God, I fished all night long, and I have not caught anything at all. He said, I'm tired. Have you, have you been tired, anybody? When God called you to ministry, you said, I'm tired. Come on, Peter said, I'm, I'm weary. I'm, I'm worn out. He said, Jesus, maybe you don't understand. And if I could paraphrase the apostle Peter, he said, I fished all night long. I have not caught anything at all. And all of a sudden, you come to me and tell me to launch out into the deep? And it was here. Notice that when Peter was having this conversation with the king of kings, that he was rowing his boat out into the deep water. And I love it because when they got to the perfect point in the lake, I believe that all of a sudden... Maybe the Holy Ghost of Heaven spoke to Peter and all of a sudden he had a divine revelation that later the Apostle John would write in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. Come on somebody. And the Word was God and all things were made by Him and nothing was made unless it was made by Him. What does that mean? It means the one that was sitting in the boat with him was the one that created the heavens yeah. and the earth and dug out the Sea of Galilee with his own bare hands. Come on, guys. And then that means that if he put the water inside the sea, he also created the fish that's inside the water. Yeah. And if he created them, he must have dominion over them as well. Amen. Can I tell you that when Peter dropped his net into the water, I'm a firm believer that every single fish inside the Sea of Galilee tried to make their way inside of that net. All of a sudden, Peter looked down. He grabbed a hold of that net and could not budge it. Come on, guys. Peter was not a 98-pound weakling. Every commentary I've read said how Peter was a big, burly man. But the Bible says he had to call his two fishing partners, James and John, that we just read about, 
who were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says it took three grown men to take that net, pull it up out of the water, and the Bible says it filled both of the boats, so they began to sink. Now listen, guys, this is not a tiny, rinky-dink boat. Come on, can I get a witness? But commentaries say this was a large fishing vessel, about 23 foot long, 7 foot wide, capable of holding about a half ton of fish each. Hmm. That one catch out of an act of obedience, the Bible says, filled both of the boats so they began to sink. And I love what happened. Peter looked at Jesus, looked down at the fish, looked up at Jesus, fell to his knees. Come on, fish flying everywhere. And said, Lord, I'm not even worthy to be in your sight. Mm. I love Jesus' response. He said, Peter, it's time for y'all to hang up your nets. He said, you no, are no longer commercial fishermen. From now on, you are fishers of men. You're no longer self-employed, but from now on, you are employed by the kingdom of heaven. Come on, guys. Amen. The Bible says they rowed their boat to shore. They left their nets in the boat behind, and they followed Jesus for the rest of their days. Come on, can you give the Lord a huge hand clap of praise today? You know, the, the Bible tells us that more than half of his disciples were commercial fishermen. John 21 tells us that at least seven of the 12 were fishermen. But have you ever wondered, of all people, why God would choose fishermen to be his disciples? Think about that. My personal opinion, because fishermen know how to cast, and they know how to catch. You and I are called to be fishers of men. We're supposed to cast the word before people and catch them for the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. amen. Fishermen are patient, persistent, and I venture to say prayerful. Mm. Um, how many of you are fishermen in the room today? Can I see you? Mm. How many of you couldn't be fishermen if your life depended on it? Because you cannot sit that long. You cannot do nothing that long. How many of you women, you get your nails done, but it is everything you can do to sit there for 45 minutes? They always yell at me and say, you don't stay long enough. I'm sorry, I got to go. I got stuff to do. Are you with me? We make bad fishermen, fisherwomen. We make really bad fish because it takes patience for them to come to you. It takes persistence. Now, we asked um, Tyler Buffington, is, uh, is he here this morning? There he is back there. Um, he brought in some fishing equipment for us because he's a fisherman. And uh, for uh, as long as we've known Tyler, he's been a fisherman and um, fishing with his daddy, fishing, um, you know, with, with, with others and learning everything. And so he brought us a cast net and uh, Pastor uh, texted me this morning and he said, we're not throwing out this cast net. It stinks so bad. So we got a cast net, but I need you to, to understand that on the end of those cast nets, um, um, they're used to be thrown out to catch the bait, right, that you're going to use to go into deeper waters. And there are um, weights on the edge of them. And so I guess Anthony was talking uh, with the Band of Brothers on Wednesday night, and they were talking about this a little bit, and uh, Kirk was talking about throwing it out and whacking somebody in the head with those weights. But can I just tell you that sometimes that's what we do? We think that when God says to go and be fishers of men, that somehow we're supposed to take our Bibles and just run all over, beating everybody in the head with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that somehow when you go to talk to somebody, you're supposed to change your voice and say, God, like we talked about last week. That somehow you need to get, you know, somehow just change your personality and, and do a lobotomy on you and, and, and stick in a preacher's brain. And that is so not the case whatsoever. In fact, we've always been told in this house that God is our judge, our Holy Spirit is the convictor, and we are just called to love. Yeah. Now, I need to rewind back to what the Holy Spirit does because the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts. Sometimes we become Christians and we take our cast nets and we think that we're just supposed to throw that out there. And, and just like hitting somebody over the head with those weights, we take the Bible and we use the Bible then to convict people. That is not what we're supposed to be doing. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict and it's our job to love. And the bait that we're supposed to be using is the bait of grace. The bait of love. Right? right? So we're going to talk about that today. Right. It's going to be a good time. 
It's going to be a good time because we need to make sure that we are patient, that we are persistent, that we are still, that we are quiet. You go out on that boat. I remember going out on the boat. I think it was my dad. I think it was some other uh, people when I was a little girl. And I just remember thinking, A, how boring. B, we can't talk loud. We can't move around. We can't, what, what, this is all we're doing. And for how long? Right. But we've got to be still and we've got to be quiet. And for some of us, we don't know how to do that very well. Right. We get to family functions. We get to Thanksgiving. We get to Christmas. We get around people and we go, oh, our opportunity to convict people. It's our opportunity to point out how wrong they are and not to just be still and to be patient and to be persistent and to be quiet just by doing what? If we're not supposed to preach at them, then we're supposed to just tell stories. We're just supposed to tell our story about what it is that God has done in a natural way, not a weird way, in a natural way. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. But here's the thing, guys. God, um, he didn't call preachers to be disciples. Mm -mm. He called fishermen. He called normal, everyday, average people. Why? That's right. Guys, do you Why? Realize, you realize that, that pastors can only reach so many people? See, Jennifer and I only see people about twice a week for a couple hours a day or a couple hours a week. But do you realize you... <laughs> we're secluded for the rest of the time. Right, we're, we're, we're locked up somewhere, right? <laughs> Listen, you, as the body of Christ, not pastors... You have the ability to reach more people than we ever can. Mm -hmm, right. Why? Because you see people all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Remember, we talked about last week that God has called us to equip you for ministry, according to Ephesians 4.12. The Bible says you, as the believers, are supposed to do the work mm -hmm. of the ministry. That's right. But let me share something with you. The work of the ministry doesn't take place inside the four walls of the church. Oh, that was when we came in. Can I get a better one? Come on. The work of the ministry does not take place inside the four walls, but it takes place outside the four walls of the church. Listen, in order for them to come in here, we must first go out there. Yeah. Guys, look, I, I was doing some studying and praying this week, and I, I came across something that, that I want to talk about real quickly. Do you realize that the Bible calls us fishers of men? That means we are called to cast and to catch people for the kingdom, right? But listen, how many know that you can't catch anybody if you don't cast your line? Mm. You can't win anybody if you never open your mouth. Come on, shake your head this way. Listen, do you realize on, 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 a, on a good Sunday when we have everybody here that's not on shift work or not out of town, we have about 200 people in service. That's a pretty good group for the small church and two services. But you know what? Here's a challenge. If we were called and did what God called us to be by being fishers of men, and, and listen, this is simple mathematics, and I want you to get this because this gets me excited. As a matter of fact, I get jagged out of my mind at the very thought of God busting this place loose and doing something crazy on the north side. Come on, guys. Amen. Do you realize, once again, we have about 200 people on a good Sunday? And listen, if everybody did their part, because we all have a part to play, right? If everybody did what God called them to do and was a fisher of men and won somebody to the Lord and invited them back here, do you realize if every person only reached one person for Christ this year, by this time next year, we would run 400 people. Are you listening? By only reaching one person for Christ per person. And if those 400 people only reach one person, the following year we'd be at 800. Come on, get what I'm saying today. And if the, the following year everybody would only reach one and bring them to the house of the Lord, you'd be at 1,600. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Then the following year, 3,200. And then in five years, we would be over 6,000 people by only reaching one person Per year. Remember, each one reach one. Man, that's not hard to do. Come on, guys. That's very, very simple to do because we all have a part to play. Remember, God called us to be fishers of men. Amen? Amen. However, he didn't call us to be cleaners of fish. Mm. 
We're called to be fishers of men, not cleaners of fish. Listen, when you're talking to somebody that's down and out and, and are doing everything wrong, don't try to change them. Right. Invite them so they can come just like they are, and then God will do the cleaning, not you. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> Listen, guys, here's the key. We live around fish. We work around fish. Maybe it's time this morning that we learn how to catch some fish. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to talk about is going to be super basic, super basic, guys. Um, but first thing that we need to do is this. We need to put bait on our hook. We need to put bait on the hook. So we're going to take a little fishing pole right here. And here's the thing. I'm going to be careful with it because chances are this is probably worth a little bit more um, than the little one that we bought Cole way back when he was like 12. Gosh, I've just never been so confused in all of my life going to a store thinking it'd be easy. He said, I want to fish, and we're like, okay, this should be easy. And then you look at all the poles, and you realize that all those poles have something to do with different water and different reasons, and all the fishermen are looking at me going, oh, sister, let me take this part of the sermon and just run with it. There's a sermon there, different fish, Oh my! different poles, different right. bait. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so what's bait, guys? Bait is any story about God's goodness. See, we all think that somehow the bait or the story is our story, that we need to keep them there, that we need to go back into our past and we need to tell them all about our salvation story and that the emphasis should be on how bad we were. See, it doesn't have to be a salvation story. Your salvation story is really simple and we need to do a class on that because here's the thing. Um, salvation story is real simple and it should be able to be done in about 10 to 30 seconds. And that's where your old intersects your new. That place, that, that place where you had an encounter with Jesus and where you are today because of him. And I want you to understand something. Your salvation experience, it, it does not require us, if you're telling that story, it doesn't require us to emphasize how bad we were, but rather how good God is. I need you to hear that. It, it's not about how bad we were. It's about how good God is is i'll never forget being um in, in mayo florida um starting out as an evangelist i remember um going back to this one church um alton church of god um every year and there was this little girl amy beth she was just the sweetest thing in the whole world she was a preacher's kid good little girl she was bawling her eyes out at the altar one day and i went down and i i, I talked with her and i said amy beth what's going on sweetie what's wrong she said my testimony's not good enough so what do you mean your testimony's not good if she goes, I've never done anything real bad wrong. She said, I, I remember, I remember the, the only thing I can come up with is that my daddy used to make sure that I wore shorts long enough um, to school and I would, I, would, I would get on the bus and I would roll them up. And then before I got off the bus to go home, I'd roll them back down. And she said, that's all my testimony is. Apparently, I've got to do a whole lot more wrong to be able to identify with more people like you. I said, oh, baby girl. No, you see, my testimony is that you can be totally a hot mess, total screw up. And Jesus, by his grace and his love, will redeem you. But let me tell you how it should be. The same grace that brought me out that rescued me is the same grace that preserved you and kept you that you would never even have a desire to run into the things and the filth that I did. You see, God's grace is a sustaining grace, not just a saving grace out of, out of the pits of hell. Sweetie, yours is how it should be. <laughs> and she just looked at me and I said, let me tell you who you get to relate to. All of the people who say, what can God do with me? What can God do with me? Same story, same question. I asked it all the time too, but from a different angle. Yours is the preserving grace. Guys, every person wants to have a miraculous encounter with God. Whether you like it or not, it's in there. It's innate. God made it so that they long to have a relationship with a heavenly father. They long to, to, to see and to hear about experiences and encounters with you and me. And, 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 and they want it for themselves, so they, they want to hear it. So when you're at the at workplace and God did something for you, you see, you tell stories in here, and that's great. 
But the stories are meant for out there. It's meant for around the water cooler. It's meant for around the lunch table. It's meant for at, at school when you're talking about what God did and you don't have to somehow shift gears and set up this long story. It's just, man, that God's so good. What's, what's God so good about? What are you talking about? Oh, you have no idea how much I was struggling with this test. And I pray that God would help me retain it. God does that. God does that. God does that. I remember one of the, the, the stories that was so um, important to my brother who is in love with Jesus and his entire family. But the first time that he ever got a glimpse that God was real and he wanted to be a part of our everyday life was when I was simply talking about, listen, why don't you pray about that parking space in Chicago in the snowstorm that you can't get? God wants to be a part of every part of your life. He circled in a storm, circled in a storm, couldn't find any place to park. And he sat there in his car, not having any place to park, trying to get to his building. And he said, God, Jen and Anthony said that you care about everything that matters to me, everything. And I know this might sound weird, but I really need a parking space. I really do. I remember the phone call. I remember him calling me. I remember him going, you will never guess what God did. He said, I circled that building. I swear, Jennifer, it was not there before. And it was right there in front of my building. He said, I praise God all the way up those stairs. I praise God all the way through the rest of the night. And I recognized that God, God wanted to be real. Everyone wants an encounter with Christ. You don't have to be weird. You don't have to be spooky. You don't have to preach at people. You just stick out that bait right there, God. It's a not about how bad you are, but how good God is, how real God is. And then, guys, we need to do this. We need to put our hook in the water. Number two. Guys, put your story. What that means is put your story in front of people. You got to be able to tell it. In other words, you got to cast your line. Guys, can I tell you, you'll never catch a fish without casting your rod. You'll never catch a fish without casting your net. And listen, Jennifer alluded to something a minute ago when she talked about different kind of bait. How many know that different fish respond to different types of bait? There's a sermon there. Different people respond to different types of conversations. Here is where we need to take a lesson from the Lord. How many know that Jesus was a key communicator and a master motivator? He always found common ground with whoever he talked to. To the fishermen, it was about fishing. Yeah. To the farmers, it was about farming. To the religious lawmakers, it was about the law. So listen, here's the key. Maybe we also need to take some... Some uh, lessons from the Apostle Paul. He said, I became all things to all people that I might win some. Are you hearing me? Paul went on to say to do the work of an evangelist. Here's what I want to tell you today. Evangelists tell people about Jesus, right? See, you can have the greatest testimony and the greatest story that gives God glory in your life. But if you fail to tell people, it will never, ever do any good mm -hmm. so my challenge to you today is this don't be a silent saint hmm. be a sharing saint amen also let me go a step further don't just tell your story but live your story let people know you by your walk right. not just your talk right. mm -hmm. guys number three is this fish where the fish are and i know you're going yeah yeah fish where the fish are See, the thing is, is, is it's great to come in here and tell each other our stories. And that encourages us, and it uplifts us, and it helps that we know each other, we know our stories, so that when somebody walks through those back doors and we hear about what they're struggling with, we know who, who to hook them up with, who to meet them with. When somebody walks through those doors and they're battling with addiction, we know exactly the people in this building that we introduce them to. Right? When someone walks through those doors and they're just having gone through divorce or they're hurting, we know exactly who to connect them with, who to introduce them to. Fish where the fish are. In other words, it's fine in here to tell each other's story, but we've got to get outside of the four walls of the church and we've got to bring the stories to where the fish are. Right? These fish are already caught. We need to bring stories out there. We need to be just real and normal. And if it's, if it's real and normal, that means that it's part of your life. It's part of your life. It's what you talk about. It's, man, let me just tell you what God did. 
And you don't have to sit them down and say, let me tell you what God just did. No, it's just in your conversation. Guys, we're going to do something today. And, and we've been doing a lot of this lately. And I personally love it. Um, over the summer, we're going to do, I think we're going to um, shift and talk about um, our story. Because our story is not, is not the value. It's our story that leads to God's story for his glory, right? So um, we may do a series this week or this summer um, called This Is My Story. And we're going to hear more from you and some of the challenges that you've walked through, how, how Jesus has been real in your life, um, where you had an encounter. Um, today in this house, it is important to share our stories. And, um, and, and there's a, a couple who is going to be leaving us here at Restored Church only because God has blessed their lives in such an amazing way and done such a great deliverance um, in their lives that they have an opportunity that God's given them to go do ministry together after more than a couple of decades of praying that that would be the case one day. And so um, we're going to bring up um, Amy uh, right now, and, um, and, and Jason and Zach is here as well, and uh, Amy knows that it, it's going to be she and I kind of talking about some things. We're going to be talking about you, Jason, if that's all right with you, um, uh, but I understand you want to stay right there while we talk about you. Is that right? Yeah, okay, he's good with that. Amy, uh, would you step out real quickly, and, uh, and let's talk about what God's done in your life. And um, this is Miss Amy Hancock and uh, Jason and Zach. Zach, will you wave your hand so people can know who you are real quickly because we know exactly who you are. And I'm going to do my best not to cry, um, and so is she. But um, she's been through it, right? Now, if you don't know it, Jason is Elaine's son, and uh, Zach obviously is Elaine's uh, grandson. And um, I know that... We could just as easily bring Elaine up here as well because they fought a good fight for Jason. And many times they fought it together, uh, encouraging one another, standing with one another, reminding each other to keep, to keep believing and keep walking. Um, Amy, uh, we, we've heard Jason's story a little bit. For, for those that haven't, would you mind kind of filling us in? Because today we're talking about the fact that um, God's called you to a mission, and he did call you to a mission that, that took great patience and perseverance and grace in order to be here today. Um, sitting with and, and worshiping God with your husband and your son. Um, can you fill us in just real quickly on the, just a brief overview of the years of struggle with Jason? Um, Jason has had an opportunity to minister to our youth. If you're wondering, why don't you bring him up here? He ministered to our youth. Um, they went to youth camp together. He's had an opportunity to share. But today is about talking about what it looks like to stand and to keep throwing out a line to someone that's just, that, that's biting and getting away or, or not biting or, or is still struggling with something? And what does that look like? What does perseverance and persistence and grace look like on a daily basis? And, and for that, there's nobody I can think of that can speak to that better. Can you give us an overview of the years of struggle with Jason? Um, so I know a lot of you probably know that um, Jason was a, a, an addict for uh, 20 years, 25 years. We've been married for 20 years, so... Um, in the beginning of his addiction, it um, it was okay. I mean, he used, and um, over the years, it progressed to um, severe. And when I say severe, I say that um, he would leave for days on end. Um, we wouldn't know if he was dead or alive. Um, he became very mentally unstable, unpredictable, unreliable. Um, you know, it was basically me and the Lord, and of course I had, I had support from our family, and um, you know, a lot of hard years of, of addiction. I don't know how many of you know what addiction really looks like up close. Um, I know we know, you know, that it destroys families, it breaks relationships, um, it destroys trust, it, it does a lot of things that just wreaks havoc on a home, and um, that was our life for many years. We didn't get along, we fought like cats and dogs um, because I wanted so desperately for him to be different. Mm -hmm. um, I knew who he was and I knew that he wasn't an addict. He was called by God to, to minister to, him, to mm -hmm. others about his struggles and 
God just continually put in my spirit that um, I had to press in and I had to speak out what I knew that God was going to call him to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't easy. It was hard. It was a day by day walk um, of trusting in the Lord and saying, God, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I really have to have your help. So, um, As far as him being arrested can, mm -hmm. several times, right? I heard that testimony yeah. that he gave yeah, so multiple, several times. Multiple incarcerations, um, in and out of jail, visits to the bondsman, right? You got those, those family members that you bond out. Um, <laughs> those that you leave a little while, too. Yeah, I did. Um, bonded him out, like, whatever, you That's know, whatever he, um, he would call on the phone and say, you got to get me out of here, you got to get me out of here, okay. Um, you know, so multiple incarcerations, um, you know, multiple treatment facilities, multiple detox units, um, that we thought, you know what, this is the last time, this is, this is going to be it, that he's going to get his life together. We are not going to have to go through this again, but it was, wasn't over yet. Hmm. Um, I, I think that we all understand what it is to give grace, but I'm not sure that we understand that grace means that when you offer grace, um, it's a grace that doesn't remind the person of how many times they failed us. It's not a grace that keeps somebody under the thumb, that manipulates and controls them with their past. Um, we do that because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to stop hurting us, right? But when God does, extends grace to us, when Jesus extends grace to us, he takes our sin and, and throws it as far as the east is to the west, right? I mean, he doesn't remind us of it. He doesn't put, his, put it in his, our faces. He gives complete grace. And that's hard because this is, this is what we understand, that sometimes people think that grace um, means that we get to be a doormat, right? And, and so for a lot of instances, I would imagine in those 20 years that the more that you would extend grace and then it wouldn't change him and then you'd extend grace again and it wouldn't change him and you're looking at this thing and there's really no sign of change and you're continually let down, most people were probably behind you laughing at you while you're standing there believing for him and saying, no, God said, God said, God said, and they're laughing at you and, and it's really not you being naive it's faith, right? So how, um, you also had, in, in the midst of that, you had a very, um, situ a very dire situation with Zach. Can you tell us about that real quick? About Zachary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Zachary is 15. He'll be 16 in April. Um, he developed seizure disorder at nine years old. Um, Jason was incarcerated, and it was Zach and I at home. He had um, just gotten over a, a, a pretty bad virus, and... Um, he kept telling me, Mama, I'm dizzy. And so I put him in the bed with me um, the night that he had his first seizure and um, had an appointment the next day to go to the pediatrician. And um, Jason was in jail. And I woke up at 11.45 to Zachary telling me, Mama, I'm dizzy. And of course, I flew out of the bed and turned the light on. And when I turned the light on, um, he was having a grand mal seizure. I was alone. Um, I say I was alone. I wasn't alone. <laughs> I was never alone. Come on. I just have to stop for a second because I was never alone. Amen. 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 When you go through something like that, I, I, we've been through a lot. Um, but when you go through something like that with your child, that's my baby. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't stop the seizure. I had to ask the Lord to help me. I had to say, Jesus, you're the only one that can, that can help us. And the paramedics came. Um, he ended up being in the hospital. Um, <coughs> after that, Zachary continued to have seizures for almost a year and a half after. Um, medication after medication after medication. The doctor shrugging his shoulders at me and telling me, I don't know what to tell you. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. Um, but I didn't stop. I did not stop praying for Zachary. I continually made him 
just put him before God every night when he would sleep. I would kneel beside his bed and I would quote scriptures. And I would say, God, by his stripes, by your stripes, he is healed. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, I, I would say, Lord, you took all of our diseases. Mm -hmm. He's made well. He is whole. We said a prayer every day. Every day we said a prayer. And it was, dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for healing me and making me whole. Yeah. And cover me with your blood. Come on, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Every day we said it. <laughs> Zachary knows it. Every day, right, Bob? Every day we said it. I got multiple calls from school that he couldn't stay in school um, because he was having seizures. I had to go pick him up from school. I was, I was, it was me and Zach. I mean, I had, I say me and Zach, we had family support. Jason was using, Jason was in active addiction. God set it up that way. I don't know why. I don't have all the answers, <laughs> but it was, that was the setup. I remember having to pick him up in school one day and um, just having an all out war with God. I couldn't work. I had to leave school. I had to leave work to go get him from school. And I remember just screaming out to God and crying out to God and saying, you know what, Lord? You said he was healed. Mm -hmm. These are not my words. <laughs> this is not what I say. This is what you say. On, and now right, I expect yeah. that he will be healed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. so, That's good. Yeah. Um, he had multiple surgeries, right? Can you show that picture real quickly? How many, how many surgeries did he have, Amy? So he had, um, I found persistence, <laughs> continuous saying, God, you know what? This is not going to be my baby's life. He's not going to have seizures the rest of his life. I knew it. I knew it. I had to press in. And um, we found an a optologist and a, a neurologist in, uh, or neurosurgeon in Orlando, Florida. Um, they were world-renowned. We didn't know it at the time. We just walked through an open door. Um, he went in for testing to see if he would be a candidate for epilepsy um, surgery, and um, they actually had to induce his seizures to find out exactly where they were happening in the brain. Um, so we went through multiple tests to find out that later that he was a candidate for surgery. Um, he had a focal point in his brain that they believed that if they could remove it, um, that he would be seizure free. And so we, we went back and he had two brain surgeries. Um, the first surgery, they went in and they put electrodes on his brain, brain to map out the seizure activity, um, which is, this is after the second surgery. So he had two surgeries. His second surgery was where they went in and they removed the, um, the part of his brain that was causing the seizures, which was part of his parietal lobe. And um, his second surgery was 11 hours long. Hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. wow. Is that the only one? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, hmm. Zachary, you didn't know that was going to be there, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she mentioned uh, just a moment ago about her job. Um, so, just to, to kind of give you an idea, she's got um, uh, a loved one at home that is self-destructing, right? Um, and uh, and for all intents and purposes, when someone is is going in and doing things we sit there and we just go, you're making this choice. You're making this choice. Just stop. Like, throw me a bone here, right? Like, help me, right? And, and then you have someone that, um, not by his own choice, um, and, and then you can't fix him. You can't fix him easy. And, uh, and then your job, can you just tell them what your job was at the time, by the way, and, and that still is? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, when I, Jason, uh, my dad was, my dad's an alcoholic. He's been an alcoholic all my life. I love my dad, um, but he's an alcoholic. And so, you know, everything that comes along with being an alcoholic. And um, I had a desire. God gave me a desire to help other people. Um, I don't know where it came from. I can't explain it. I can just tell you that it was a desire that I had to, to get an education, um, to go to school. I went back to school when Zachary was two. Um, I earned a master's degree in mental health counseling and um, did some substance abuse studies. I'm now a licensed mental health counselor, um, and I work at a substance abuse treatment facility. So I, I need you to kind of grasp this real quickly because I can imagine that the enemy on a daily basis would say to you um, that you can help everybody else except for your own husband in your own home. 
right? I, I can imagine uh, those that the way that he would just sit on your shoulder and beat you up. And um, I remember meeting with you here one morning over you know years ago um, when we first got in the building, I think, and and you were sharing with me that no one at work knew that you had a husband who was an addict at home. And meanwhile, she would go in every single day and work with addicts. Is anybody with me? Yeah. I, I, would that confuse anybody's prayers? Would it frustrate you at all? You know, God, I'm here and I'm doing this. How about you help him? And I can imagine that, that at the times, now I need you to understand that she has shared with me, and because of time, we won't be able to get into um, too much, but I want you to know that um, I, I need to ask her, how did you get along from day to day with that, extending grace to somebody, persevering, um, being patient, extending grace, uh, and, and there's no sign that it's sinking in, um, praying over Zachary every single day, multiple surgeries, and going every single day to work and being diligent to sow into the lives of other people. How, how did you not end up in that treatment center yourself? Um, I don't really know, but um, no. I, I pressed, I just, I, I really believe, somebody told me a long time ago that you do for others what you expect God to do for you. How did you manage day to day? And um, day to day, I just... I woke up in the morning and prayed. I spent time with the Lord. I did a devotion every day. Um, I asked God for wisdom. Every day I asked God for wisdom. I asked him to go ahead of me to help me make good decisions. Um, continually repented of sins in my life, of unforgiveness. I struggled with unforgiveness. I could have really probably killed him at a time or two or three. But um, I had to just press into God. I had to go to church. I had to be around Christian people. I had to have people in my life that um, that would support me. And then I had to have enough sense to stay away from the people that okay. agreed with the, with the world that said, you're crazy for staying. What are Come you on. doing? Come on. Um, Come on. You need to be moving. You know, you don't deserve this. That's what the world will say. The world yeah. will tell you that you don't deserve this type of this type of stuff and the enemy, too. So I had to. It was God. You know, God God does for us what we sometimes we can't we can't do or we don't understand and his grace is sufficient and I realized that in our weakness, in my weakness, his power became strong. Yeah. Just like the word says, you know, that his grace is sufficient. I don't even fully understand grace today. Mm. I don't know mm. that I ever will. Mm. But I know that because he loves me, that I can love other people. That's right. Mm. Um you know, it's a, an amazing testimony uh, about where they are today, and, and I want her to get to that, and then we'll wrap this up. And it's a miracle to, to see what God's done in Jason's life. It's a miracle to look at Zach today. Um, I remember when Elaine had called us and said, told us about Zach and said, do you think that there could be any place for Zach. Do you think the youth group would take him? I, I, I remember him first coming to youth group when Pastor Johnny was our, our youth pastor. And I remember one of the first um, messages that he sat there in youth group um, and he took off his shoe and, and chucked it across the room. And uh, most churches would have gone, yeah, there's really no place for him here. Um, but you know what we have learned is that we, we endure together. We love together together we we meet each other right where we're at and we we extend grace and sometimes you got to go in another room and pray and I love what Amy just said and we've got to wrap this up because um, I, I would love to stay all day because this woman is a powerhouse for God Jason is a power if you're saying why are you talking about him right there this is a man of God he is Amy's going to share with you where he is today and Zach but I need you to understand something did you recognize that what she said <laughs> now, what she said was that, how did you manage day to day? I continually repented of my sin, asked God to help me to forgive, asked God to help me get myself straight so that I could respond in such a way. I need you to understand something. Um, she came to this church one morning, and when she started telling me about what she was living with and what she did for a living and all of her degrees in mental health and, and, and addiction, I'm sitting there as a pastor thinking, holy Lord, 
She came today to ask me how to help her husband, and I have no clue what to say to her because she knows far better than I will ever know about how to get her husband fixed because that's really what counseling is about, right? You, you meet with somebody to say, will you fix my son? Will you fix my daughter? Tell me how to get them fixed. And here's what's amazing is I quickly realized that Amy wasn't meeting with me to see what else I knew about how to get her husband fixed. She was coming to me to say, listen, all I need today is for you to clarify what I already know. I need you to stand with me in prayer. I need you to know what's going on behind the scenes. I've already, I've already gotten a word from God and I'm standing on it. But because I am a psycho, I'm a counselor at work and I'm a wife at home to him, I find that sometimes I bring my, my work home to my husband and I try to evaluate him and I try to, um, and I try to, um, to fix him um, with all these terms and with all of these psychology things and all of that. And it's just getting foggy. And I just came today because I need you to fix me. That's what's so awesome. See, when you're going through something like this, you'll quickly find out that prayer in, and what you're going through has more to do with God fixing you than the person that you're dealing with, right? And I love that because she came to me to say, not fix my husband, but instead help me to get my head on straight and clarify my role. And I said, oh, I can do that. I'm a grace woman. And this is what I said. This is what I know. This is what I know. God's called you to be his wife. There's your role to be his wife, to love, to be a safe place for him, to keep that bridge open. Because if you believe he's coming back, I'll believe with you. And he is coming back. And we're going to believe for that. And let me tell you something, as much as, as it is a miracle about what's happening in these two, to me, and you don't know this, but the greatest testimony for me is listening to you constantly stand on the word. Right. We would have women's group, and every time Amy would open her mouth, and I don't know if she felt it, I don't know if she was thinking it, or if she had just walked in it for so long that it was something that she just knew there are no other options. When she would talk, she would not say, I'm worried about she wouldn't say, uh, I'm not sure if. She would say, this is what God said. This is what his word says. I am standing on that. And to me, the biggest testimony of this is how strong of faith and strength she had in the word and that declaration and she stood on it and there was no if, ands, or buts and there was no, I'm not really sure. It was a, I know it, I know it, and I know it. And I'll know it until my feelings line up with it and know it. And I'll know it and I'll speak it. And no matter what anybody says, this is what I'll stand on. Amy, you said this and we'll wrap this up. You once told me that you've come too far to give up now. Um, you once told me that you refuse to walk out that door now, that you refuse to forfeit your blessing on all of it because you will not, you will not walk away from this man and let somebody else reap the benefits of everything that you've endured, right? Can you tell me, can you, what would you say to somebody, real quickly, what would you say to somebody that is dealing with somebody at home and they are struggling to continue to extend grace to somebody who's not getting it? What would you say to somebody who is um, dealing with a child at home or a loved one at home that they can't easily fix? What would you say to them? And, and what would you say to them as encouragement today? What do they need to do? Um, they need to believe God and get into the word. Um, Get, in, get around Christian people that that line up with the word of God. Um, get a word from the Lord. It's important that you get a hold of what God says because if you, if you don't do that, the world will persuade you and the enemy will persuade you that you don't deserve it. Don't you see what's happening? Because if I looked at the natural every time I looked at Jason or even with Zachary, if I looked at the natural, I was done. Come on. I was done. It was not gonna. It was not helping me at all to look at the natural. You can't see the natural. You have to press into the supernatural, yes. and you have to believe what God says. Whose report do we believe? Come on. That's right. Right. We have to believe the report of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. That's it. It's the report right. of the Lord. But press in. Ask God what you're supposed to do. He'll give you a word. He's faithful. Amen. He'll put it in your heart what you need to do, and then you got to obey and you got to yield. Yeah. Even if you don't feel like it today, because there was a lot of days that I failed and I beat myself up. 
I would scream and yell at him. Asked Elaine, she could hear it at her house. She lives behind us. <laughs> I'm telling you, ask her. She knows. We would go through it, and I would feel terrible. I'd get before God, and I'd say, God, let's do it again. I can't do it on my own, but you know what we need, and we'd press in. Yeah. Believe the Lord. Believe him. Amen. Believe him. Don't give up. To take no other option, right? And, and that's what I got from her every single time she opened her mouth. Can you fill us in real quickly about how you waited for those blessings? You waited, you persevered, you were patient, um, and, and you continued with grace. Um, you depended on the Lord. Can you tell us where you guys are today and what's happening in your life today? Can you? I always love it. She says I'm patient. Mm. Um, not God is patient. Um, so today we are... Um, leaving Jacksonville, Florida Thursday um, morning at 7 a.m. We'll be headed to Panama City, Florida. Um, God has given us an opportunity to um, start a treatment facility there, um, <laughs> which, which is crazy. Um, I don't deserve it. I don't. I'm not qualified. I'm really not. There could have been anybody else picked for the job, but God picked me. <laughs> God picked me, not man. Come on. This is ordained by God. We yeah, know it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he has confirmed his word. We asked for his direction. We prayed. We waited. And God came through. Um, so Where is Jason and Zach today? Can you, that, um, can you fill us in on? Zachary has been... Um, Seizure-free since his surgery. Almost Come on. Six yeah. years ago. Woo! Um, he's a miracle from God. Um, he continues to grow, and he's his own person. And um, Mama still needs a lot of work, and he's my baby. And I just have to continually give him to God every day. Amen. Jason is free. Come on. Woo! Yeah. Don't need work there, but um, you know, he's free. He's walking with the Lord. He's pressing in every day. He gets up in the morning. He's like, "Let's do a devotion," and I'm like, "This is weird." Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we did communion a lot together. Um, we fasted together. We prayed together. Um, we agree together. That's a big thing, right? Because if you lived like I lived for 20 years <laughs> with your husband running drugs, um, doing drugs, whatever. We pray together. Right. We ask the Lord for his direction. He desires to have God first place in our home, and so do I. Woo! There's yeah, nothing yeah, like yeah. walking yeah. together right. versus walking apart. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I want to encourage you, if you got a husband out there that's, that's wayward, that's doing his own thing, get, get with the Lord. That's right. Right. Ask him what you should do. Because it's a me society, and the world will tell you, go after what you want. Right. Go do what you want. Right. There was no way, there was no way that I, I knew in my heart that he would be free. Mm -hmm. And that we would be walking with the Lord, and that God would call us into ministry. That's and right. there was no way mm. I was forfeiting that. Right. <laughs> right. I wouldn't turn any over. He's too good looking. I wouldn't turn any over to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Come Amen. on, guys. Give the Lord a hand clap Amen. of praise today. Um, thank you for sharing your heart today. Um, and she's going to open up her life a little bit and her struggles. Can you help us to to kind of just get up to speed for those that don't know? Give us a brief overview um, of the years of struggle with, with Jason so that we can kind of see your perspective as a wife behind the scenes. Um, and, and what does it look like in real life? Can you tell us about that struggle? Sure. Um, Jason has shared a little bit of his testimony here at Restore. Um, being an addict for 20 plus years. Um, we've been married for, for 20 years. And um, so living with, with, a, with someone that is an addict is, um, is interesting. Um, it is very challenging <coughs> and a lot of broken promises, a lot of letdowns, um, no trust. Um, several and many incarceration incarcerations probably in jail five times um many treatment facilities um, many detox facilities um just looking for an answer trying to find um trying to find hope and hoping that 
that treatment facility that he goes to will be the last time that we that I have to take him to a treatment facility or detox. That'll be the last time, or the the time that he says I'm not going to use anymore. Um, I've had enough. I'm going to stop. That that be the last time. Um, but really, it it wasn't the last time. It went on for it went on for many years. Um, so. You know, if you have anybody in your life that's an addict or you've been around it, addict or alcoholic, you know exactly what it looks like. You know what it feels like. I lived with um, feelings like I wasn't good enough. I felt like that he loved the drugs more than me. Um, he loved the people that he ran with more than me um, and our son. And so it was a constant battle um, that I had to continually put before the Lord. Hmm. Um. So you were called to this mission. It required patience and persistence and grace. Um, how difficult is that to continue to extend grace to somebody when there's no real sign of change, continual letdowns? Um, how did you deal with that? I don't, I don't really know that I did. Um, now I can look back in hindsight and think um, that it wasn't anything that I did because I failed daily. I was real quick to tell him about his butt, um, you know, or to like try to fix him. I'm the person that's trying to grab the fish out of the water, um, you know, but I, I know that God did for me some things that I couldn't do for myself. As long as I continually put myself before the Lord and I put him before God and I said, you know what, God, I'm broken. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to fix him. I don't know how to love him. Um, I don't I don't know how to be a mom. I don't know how to do any of those things. I had to continually seek the Lord and ask for forgiveness for my sins and really just look to the Father to know that he was faithful and is faithful and that anything that I that is broken that I present to the Lord that he will fix. That's right. So day by day I just just got before God and some days I was mad and was like I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this but God draws you back. He reminds you of what you need to do. Hmm. Um, I love what she said. If you if you caught that, um, she said that to keep on going, she would go before the Lord and ask him to forgive her sins, um, to make her heart right. Um, that's powerful to me, and I'll tell you why. Um, there was, a, there was one morning that I met Amy um, right here, right after we got in the building, and I, I loved it because um, she wanted to meet me early. She wanted to, to kind of just share some things that were going on, and she needed some help, and, 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 you know, just, I figured that as a pastor, she wanted to meet with me because she needed my help and direction on fixing something. And so I met with her, and I didn't know what she did for a living. Um, can you just briefly tell us what, what, you, what you do right. <laughs> for a living? Like. Right, yeah. Um, it's interesting, I know. Um, uh, early on, my, my father was an alcoholic and was married to an addict, and I'm like, okay, I can't fix him, can't fix him, so let me go fix somebody else. And... Uh, decided to go to school for um, for substance abuse counseling. Um, ended up getting my master's in mental health and um, focused on substance abuse. And now I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Mm -hmm. So I work at a treatment facility with addicts and alcoholics. Hmm. So she works um, at a treatment center helping others to overcome the very thing that is eating alive her husband by day. I can't imagine how the enemy would sit on your shoulder and completely make you feel like a failure and a fraud, by the way, um, that, that you can help the whole world but not your own loved one in your own home, right? Um, I love it because when she came to the church that day and she started you know, sharing with me about you know, what she does and, and Jason, I had no idea. I kind of knew, but I had no idea. I knew more about another part of her life you'll hear about in a second. I had no idea. And what was amazing to me is the more she began to talk, the pastor in me started going, uh-oh. She met me here to figure out how I can help her with her husband. And I don't know nothing compared to what she knows. And I got nothing for her. 
And the more that she began to talk, the more I started having that panic, like, Lord, what am I going to say to her? Like, she knows more than I know. And then all of a sudden, I heard something amazing inside of her. She was coming to me not to fix her husband, but because she had already come to the realization that when you're dealing with something or someone that you cannot change, the only thing you have control over is how you change you and how you respond in that situation. Right. And what was so awesome to me was that I, I quickly began to realize as she was saying, I already know what to do. I already know what God's told me to do. It just gets a little foggy sometimes. And I came here today so, so that you could agree with me in prayer that he's coming and you can agree with me and stand with me because I won't take no for an answer. God's going to do this. And, and then I began to hear her say, I, I need you just to help me to get clear on my role because my job is not to fix him. That's God's. My job is to get my heart right, forgiveness in my heart. My job is to get me right so that I'm responding with grace, so that I'm responding with love, so that I am there in the middle of it and I am not a hindrance to what God wants to do in his life. So she was, I'm like, I got this. I know how to help you to stand in grace. I don't know how to help him, but I do know this. I do know. And, and I, somebody's here today and you need to know this that you're going to prayer and you're being told by your pastor or somebody that you need to get into the word and you need to stand on the word and you're going, yeah, 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 yeah. But is the word going to change him? No, the word's going to change you. The word's going to change you so that you're not reacting to everything that happens, but you're responding the way that Jesus did, right? right? And that's what's so powerful. Amy said to me last night over the phone, she said, you know, if people could realize that it has really a whole lot less to do with them than it does what God's doing in us, it would really connect some dots to them, right. connect some dots to them. So after all of that and all that's going on, can you also give us a brief uh, overview of what was also happening uh, with Zach at the time while your husband was in the throes of the enemy? Um, so Zachary, he's here. He's, um, Wave your hand, Zach. He'll be. He's a good looking boy. I'm can sorry. you put that down just um, real quick? I'll, I'll call you on it. He is, he'll be 16 in April. Um, he, um, he's our only son, and he's my, he's my baby. He is my, my heart, and um, he, he developed seizure disorder at, at nine years old, and Jason was heavy in his addiction at the time. Um, he was incarcerated, actually, when Zachary had his first seizure. Um, it was in the middle of the night, and Zachary had, uh, had a virus for about 10 days that he just couldn't, he was really struggling with it and sick, and um, he kept telling me, Mama, I'm dizzy. You know, Mama, I'm dizzy, and the night he had the seizure, I had put him in the bed with me um, just because I didn't feel good about leaving him where he was and was planning to take him to the doctor the next day, and when he woke up in the middle of the night and he said, Mama, I'm dizzy, and I just flew out of the bed, turned the lights on, and it was just me and him. Jason was in jail. Um, I felt scared. I felt alone. I felt desperate. I can't even put into words what was running through my mind at that time. But then I really quickly realized that I wasn't alone and that I wasn't fighting this by myself and that I couldn't fix it. I couldn't do anything, but I knew that the Lord could. And um, after that, he ended up having seizures for about a year and a half. And it was seizure after seizure after seizure medications, um, going back and forth to the doctor, and the doctor basically getting to the point to where he shrugged his shoulders at me, and I was like, oh, goodness, this is not working, and basically saying, there's nothing I can do, and um, I just continued to go before God. I would, I would kneel down where he was sleeping at night. I would anoint him with oil, and I would claim the scriptures, yeah. and I would say, God, by, his, by your stripes, he is healed. Yeah. You took all of this upon the cross, and you healed him, and he is healed. And, and I stood, and I stood. I was afraid. I was so afraid. You have no idea the fear that grips you when your child has a seizure. But I knew that my help come from God, and there was nothing that I could do but rely on him. And we found um, me and my persistence and just not accepting no for an answer. I knew my baby would not have seizures the rest of his life. I knew it. I stood on the word, and God put it in my heart, and I said, you know what? I'm not accepting this. This is not going to happen. 
God is the answer and he's going to come through. And we found doctors in Orlando. They were world-renowned physicians. We had no idea who they were, but God put them right in our path. Um, he had two brain surgeries. The first one was to map out the seizures to see exactly where they were happening from. We were like in all of this process, Picture. could not believe what God was doing. Um, turns out that he was a candidate for surgery. Mm. Um, they removed part of his parietal lobe. This was his second surgery. Um, he had two. This was the second surgery, which was 11 hours long. Mm. Um, and that was excruciating to say the least. I don't even know how we got through it, but other than God, because mm -hmm. I can't, I can't do it by myself and I couldn't do it then and I still can't do it now. But, um, Anyways, that was almost six years ago. And there's my boy. He's been seizure free yeah. ever since. Come on. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, guys, I, I, one of the reasons why um, I knew that Amy, not just because they're going to be um, leaving us and we're going to be heartbroken over it, but it was perfect timing because we knew what we were bringing. And here's these scenarios. You, you have someone that... You know, it, it, it's, it's with Zach, she, there was nothing you could do. He, Zach didn't sign up for it. He wasn't doing it. It wasn't his fault. But then when you're dealing with somebody that's just rebelling, um, not receiving, not, you know, for all intents and purposes, there are choices that are being made. And, and you just want to go, come on, throw me a bone and make a better choice already. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm believing for you. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, and Jason would sit there, and, and what I loved, what I absolutely loved, was that when we sat in, in these chairs, Amy, you looked at me and you said, but that's not my husband, and that's not who he is. The choices that he's making are his choices, but... That's not who he is. I know him when he is looking at me in the eyes, crying out to me, Amy, I don't want to be this way. I don't, this is not who I want to be. And what's amazing about grace is that grace looks beyond what someone is doing and sees who they truly are on, and speaks to that person yeah. to rise up. Yeah. I love that. Amen. And so you have this woman that is standing there in between these two things, one thing uh, that they can't control and the other that could control it, but that's not. And, and she's right there. And let me just tell you that every time, and the greatest testimony to me was Jason, you're going to hear where Jason is right now and where Zach is right now. But to me, the greatest testimony was you, Amy. And um, I would come home from um, women's class and I would tell, sorry. Um, I would look at Anthony and I would say, she inspires me so much because when the woman opens her mouth, and, and maybe it wasn't always like this. Maybe it took you, you told me that it took you several years um, to get it right, uh, many years. Um, but when Amy would open her mouth in class, it, she would not hedge. She would not, she would not waver in her faith. She would not be here in church going, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then when you would talk to her at the back door, she wouldn't go, yeah, I'm really worried. No, no. See, to her, it was only the word. This is God's word. This is what he said. And, and, sh and maybe you didn't feel it every time. And maybe your brain was, you know, maybe you were fighting yourself on the inside, but she would always make a declaration of what God said. This is what I'm standing on. This is what God said. This is what I'm believing for. That is not my husband. I know my husband. That is not him. And I am standing for the man that I know that he is to arise up and to be. And that's who he would. That's what she would say all the time. And it was such an encouragement to me. Can I just tell you that most people look at people that quote the word in the midst of their circumstances. And they want to go. What a naive idiot. She is in denial. She's sitting there saying Zach is healed. And meanwhile, have you seen him? Do you know what I'm saying? She's sitting here saying my husband's delivered and she has no idea. No, she had an idea. She knew though the circumstance, but she knew God's word. 
Can you talk to, to us about what to do about how to, uh, or maybe what we say is this, what would you say to a weary parent out there? What would you say to someone that's dealing with a loved one that's either throw, in the throes of, of rebellion or addiction and choices being made, or, or, or a mama or a daddy that's here today, or a loved one that's dealing with someone with uh, an ailment or an illness that cannot be easily fixed? What would you say to that? I would say that um, about their circumstance to, to, to get before God, um, to go to the Word, block out people. People will tell you what they think they know, and they don't really know anything. Come on, um, come on, that's good. They'll look at it from a natural perspective, and they'll tell you you're crazy. Yeah. I had plenty of people tell me, "What are you doing?" Look, I mean, he's in jail again. Um, he's in treatment again. He's gone for months. Um, it went on for years. So I would, I would, I would say you got to get a word from the Lord. You got to get before him and you won't, you won't get a word from the Lord if you don't spend time with him. Come on. Come on. If you want to know how to fix your problems, you got to spend time with the problem solver because he's the one that can do it. Come on. Um, get in, get in his presence, block out this world because the world will drag you down. The people that are in the world and serving the things of this world, they got an opinion and it's not God's opinion. God says we don't give up people, give up on people. We don't, we don't say that people are useless or, or that they'll never amount to anything or they'll always stay the same. That's not God's way. That's right. God doesn't work that way. Just as much as he loves you and he extends grace to you, he wants you to do the same for that person on, that you're come on. with. Come yeah. on. It's hard. It's not easy. But that means that you can't do it without him. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not what we do. It's what he does in us. Right. Right. Took me a long time, and I still struggle with it. I can't sit here and tell you that I understand it. I don't. I don't understand everything, but I know God's good. That's right. And I know you got to dig your heels in, put your shoes of peace on, and plant them firmly on the ground. Come on, and come dig on. them in as far as you can go and do not move right. until God says move. That's right. That's good. Mm. Right. We'll wrap it up this way. You once told me that you have come too far to give up now. You once told me that you refused to forfeit the blessing of a saved and delivered and changed man to somebody else yeah. after all the work has been done <laughs> by you. Oh, yeah. Right? No. no. <laughs> have you seen him? I mean, have you seen him? He's just way too good looking for me to lie. <laughs> Are you <kidding? laughs> Anybody with eyes can see. It's like, I'm, a, I'm doing good. He's a that. good um, man. Yeah. He is a good man. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy for me. Because I knew him outside of his addiction. I knew, I knew his heart. God let me see that. I said, God, you know, help me to love him like you love him. Help me to be his wife as you've called me to be. And I didn't feel it, and it didn't look like it. And I was gritting my teeth, and I was, like, ready for bear. But I just had to go with the word. And God gave me insight into his heart. Mm. That's the supernatural power of God. That I could be so mad at what was happening and be like appalled, like really, are you doing this? And then God would say, "Wait a second, look at his heart," because that's what I look at. Yeah. I look at the heart. That's right. mm. And so, you know, that was, I wasn't throwing that away. Mm-hmm. God does. God does it. He gives you the desire, <clears throat> and when He gives you the desire, then you got to yield to the call. That's right. Mm. That's good. Um. We'll wrap this up. Can you testify about where they are today and where you guys are today? Well, Zachary is um, healed. He's whole. He's well. He's covered in the blood. He has a future. Right, baby? He has a future. Um, He's independent. And I'm so thankful. I rejoice every day. If If I look at what's swirling around me, and it's so easy to say what you don't have or what you think you should have or this ain't going right or that ain't going right, you know, but you just stop for a second and say, you know what, look at all that God has done. Mm. Look at all. I have no reason to complain. I tell Jason that all the time. Please help me. Remind me if I'm complaining because I got no reason to complain. Zachary is, is my true gift from God. Yeah. He shows me every day what it's like to walk with the Lord. <laughs> um, Jason is set free. Woo! Truly. He's like David. He's a man after God's own heart. We pray together. We read the word together. We do fast together. We do communion together. We walk together. 
that's different than all those years. I walked alone. I sat in the church by myself. There's somebody here. Your husband didn't come with you. Don't stop coming. Come on. Come Keep on. coming. Yes. Keep coming. Stay there. Don't go to the other side because if you go to the other side, you're on a winning, you're on a losing team. Right. If you stay here, you're on the winning team. Right. And you know, our life is completely different. I, I truly just, just look up because I know that my help has come from him. Mm-hmm. And I will never, never take for granted what he's done for us. And, and daily, we just continually submit to the Lord. Tell us where you're going, what you get to do. Yeah. So <laughs> we're leaving Jacksonville. Um, God has called us to Panama City, Florida, which is beautiful, right? Yeah. It's um, beach and white sand. And, you know, that's the perks of, of being in Panama City. Um, but God has called us there. We are starting a treatment facility in <laughs> Panama on, City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, I got my money. (laughs) That should be, like, important, right? Like, the first thing, but, um, I mean, it is important. It's really important. God, you know, we lived in a mobile home for years, and and I love my mobile home. It's been a blessing to me. We've been in it for 20 years, but I would say, you know what, God, I want a house. I want a house. I wish you would have said I want a house in Jacksonville. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. So we got a house in Panama City, Florida, which is really cool. Amen. Amen. So after years and years of, of believing and, and desiring, because God will give you the desires of your heart, to, to do ministry with her husband um, and Zach, they get to go do ministry together and uh, for the first time and start again. And it's just awesome. Guys, how awesome is it that patience and persistence pays off? Amen. Come on, when you couple that with the power of prayer, great things happen. You know what? She goes, I was, I was for the longest time, she was working from a single income and praying because God is a God of increase. Come on, remember what we prayed this year? A year of release and increase. Here's what's awesome. Guess what? She goes, she's leaving here, going there, and God blessed her with an income of double what she had here. We serve a God that will give you double for your trouble. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Um, Guys, we've got gifts and stuff for them. We'll give it to them in the back instead of right here. But could you um, please give it up? That she, if you don't know this, she uh, worked faithfully and served our children uh, in children's uh, ministry. And, uh, and, and Jason with the youth um, the last, gosh, year. And, uh, and Zach, of course, has just been a huge blessing. And, of course, we will miss them, but this is always their home. They're just going to their next assignment. That's right. and, um, and so we're going to pray for them. Uh, but would you give it up for them? and all that God has done. Thanks, Amy. Um, I, I just want to say that how much of a blessing that Restore Church has been to us, and you guys, uh, I love you very much. Don't cry. I'm not at all. <laughs> um, we've, you know, I first started coming here. Y'all know, I mean, Anthony's the, the, the walking Bible, and... Jennifer's the application of the Bible. The Bible and the footnotes. Yeah, so Jason's like, him and Anthony get along really well because they know all that stuff. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But um, how, do, how can I use it today? And, but I can, I can tell you that when we first started coming here, I was like, I, told, I think I texted you and I said, I, f- I feel naked when I come to church. Like, really and truly, I had been in church for 20 years. I got saved right when Jason and I got married. And... When I came to Restore Church, I felt like all was revealed, and I hadn't even said anything. I hadn't even talked about what I needed to talk about, and I just, I felt like I was just open and laid out before God, and that discernment that Jennifer has in the word that Pastor Anthony has is just amazing. We have been loved on. We have been encouraged. I can't say there's ever been a time that I didn't feel like that we weren't appreciated, You know, not that we need that because we work unto the Lord, but they go above and beyond to express their love for this church. And you guys are very blessed to continue to be under them. So thank you for what you do. Love you, honey. Love you. So proud of you. Um, guys, we're going to wrap this up, and I'm sorry to keep you. Um, if we could put a fourth uh, point to this, it would just be simply this. The start of those words, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The follow me part is what we're driving home today. 
The follow me part says, follow me, do it my way. You want to be fishers of men? Do it the way I did, with grace, with persistence, with patience. If you'll do that, I'll catch the fish. If you'll learn grace, and you'll learn persistence, and you'll learn patience, and you trust me, I'll bring them in. I'll do the work, and I'll change in the meantime. Follow me. Do it my way is what he's saying. And we're going to end this way. Maybe you're here today and you say, this is so for me right now because, number one, I need grace, and it's good to know that my God has more grace for me, that his grace never runs out, that his love never runs out, that he gives me love, not a lecture. He gives me grace, not a guilt trip. He's there for me, and he's there with me, and he counts me a work in progress. And maybe you're on the other side. Maybe you go, I'm glad he counts me as a work in progress, but I don't do so good counting others as a work in progress. And I need to do better with that. If you're here today and you said, this message is for me because I need grace or I need to extend grace one more time and I need to trust God, this is for you. We're going to down the lights. The band's going to come right now. And I just want to ask you this question. Do you know that his love doesn't run out for you? That his grace is ever flowing? Amy said it best when she said, I am not patient. God is patient. There's somebody here today. There was a part of this message was all about you. You are sitting there with a loved one who you can't fix easily. And you pray and you pray and you pray and it seems like it's not getting through and there's no change that you could see with your natural eye and the enemy's trying to wear you out and wear you down and tell you to give up but you came today to receive this word to know that God's timing is perfect. You will dig your heels in. You will not give up. You will get in the word. You will receive a word for yourself and you will speak it over that situation. You will not speak about what you see in the natural. You will speak about the supernatural, what God can do because he is faithful. He's done it before. He'll do it again. For others of you, you're about to give up on somebody else because they keep wearing you down and they keep ignoring you and they keep not obeying what you're saying or they keep not respecting you or loving you or being there. They're not even trying. And I love what Amy said today that I started to realize that it was really less about JC being fixed and it was really more about me changing my heart towards him. God was going to leave me right there in that situation because he wanted to do something in me. He was already working on Jason. And perhaps you're here today and you say, this message is for me because I see that God's trying to change me. And I'm so quick to give up and throw in the towel and say, oh, woe is me. But God wants to build in me perseverance. And he wants to build in me the ability to wait upon him and to trust him no matter what. He never promised us there would be no storms in life. But he did promise us he would be right there in the storm with us. So if you're here today and this word was for you, in any way, shape, or form, I want you to receive it. Someone in here today needs to receive grace. You need to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to out with all the excuses and all the, and all the buts and all the ifs and all the ands and all the I knows. Throw them out. I don't care what you used to know. I, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what happened then. What matters is what God wants to do in you now, today. If you're here today and you're an addict and you walked in here, guess what? You just heard that God's still working on you and he's not finished with you and you finally found a place that will love you and that will be a safe place for you. We won't always get it right. I promise you that. But we're sure trying the best we can. 
For some of you, you walked in here and you've got church hurt. Somebody hurt you out there. That's not a reason to stay out of church because God didn't hurt you. People, man, we just suck sometimes. Guys, we're awful. But God is always faithful. He never messes up. So if you need to receive him today, you need to receive grace today, you're ready to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm moving forward. I'm tired of going around this mountain. God's obviously got my number and he ain't going to let me alone until I do. Then just come. And if you're here today and God still got you around a mountain dealing with something that seems like you just have no control over it, then chances are you don't. But what you do have control over is this. How will you respond in the midst of that situation? How will you love that person that's unlovable? How will you extend grace to that one that needs grace in order to change? Because grace is the only thing that changes anybody, guys. It's not guilt, guilt trips. It's not, it's not manipulation. It's not lectures. It's grace. So how will you respond from now on? And the only way you can respond properly is if you have a proper heart right before the Lord. So if this message is for you, I want you just to receive it. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you've said to us today. Thank you for the honesty, the transparency. Thank you that this is a safe place where we can literally walk through those doors and say, I don't have it all together. Thank you, Lord, that we're a work in progress. And thank you that you commission us to extend grace to those who are a work in progress too. Help us to do better with that. Help us to receive from you better. And help us to dig our heels in and stand on nothing but your promises and your word because you are faithful. You are faithful. Father, in the name of Jesus, we worship you today. We thank you for knowing right where we're at and speaking so real to us today. You are a good God, and you love us, and you accept us, and you forgive us, and you count us valuable every day, no matter what. In Jesus' name.